But if you have the passion to solve a problem, you'll find a way to solve it, no matter what comes in your way. Welcome back to 40 Minute Mentor, the podcast on a mission to raise aspirations and inspire the next generation of category defining founders. From purpose led entrepreneurs to Olympic champions, you'll learn firsthand from what it takes to be a successful leader, all in just 40 minutes. In today's VC feature series, we're joined by Zeynep Yafuz, fintech partner at General Catalyst. General Catalyst is a top tier VC that invests from early stage through to growth equity stages. With over $28 billion of assets under management, the firm has backed some of the world's biggest tech companies, including Airbnb, Warby Parker, and Stripe. Having grown up in Turkey with entrepreneur parents, Zeynep saw firsthand that a more mature VC ecosystem in the country could have been really transformative to her parents' tech company. So to be part of that change, she focuses on fintech and crypto investments on a global scale and particularly with a focus on emerging markets. I'm super excited to dig more into Zeynep's background, her route into VC, and get her candid advice for any founders that are currently fundraising. So Zeynep, thank you for joining us on 40 Minute Mentor. How are you today? Doing really well. Thank you for having me. Oh, it's a great pleasure. Well, we're going to warm you up with some quick fire questions, if that's okay. Please finish the following sentences after me. My first ever investment was... Um, a capital market software company called ITRS. I invested in ITRS when I was at TA. It was a profitable growth business. And also it was my first introduction to financial technology. Oh, amazing. Good stuff. And the deal I am most proud of is? That's a tricky one because it's hard to call out one. But I'd say that I'm particularly proud of my investments that have a positive impact in people's lives and this is what motivated me to join World Remit as well as an operator and invest in companies like Yoko, which is a POS in South Africa that's empowering small business owners, or Cadmos that enables unbanked people to collect their wages digitally. I think that's one of the most amazing things about technology, isn't it? And being an investor is nowadays there are so many purpose driven companies that are having a a really positive impact on the world. Those two things can go hand in hand, can't they? Great scale and commercial impact, but also doing really good. Thank you for sharing that. I wish I would have invested in... Having worked in uh, cross-border payments, I really am super excited about the potential for changing payments infrastructure, particularly in cross-border payments. I think I'm, I'm just amazed by what Circle has achieved by creating USCC and the future for that company. That's a great answer. We're looking forward to talking a bit more about all things fintech and crypto as the conversation goes on but thank you for that the hardest part of being in vc is there are no levers to pull in vc my background is in operating and it's in private equity and in both of them you're quite hands-on in venture you can't really do that you partner with the founder and you take a leap of faith in that founder and that's kind of the beauty of it too because you get to partner with truly exceptional people but i'd say that's one difficulty of being a venture investor and i think it's changing slightly as well as venture investors are becoming more active advisors to their portfolio companies final question the one thing i'd like to change about vc is more vc investors were focused on building truly enduring companies this was one of the reasons where i hesitated about joining venture actually about the intellectual honesty uh, of the business especially in the recent market hype there's been a lot of investors you know, focusing on making quick returns on artificial increases in company valuation when there's no change in the underlying business. I think that was something, was a question in my mind because I wanted to invest in companies that would become enduring businesses. And that was the reason I joined GC because at GC we invest day one. So we're there at seed. And then we'll be there to IPO and sometimes even post IPO. It's amazing that you can see that whole journey through. Really interesting and really looking forward to Uh, coming on to how you did end up in VC because I think that concern you had is probably something that a lot of people listening have had about the industry before so hopefully we can quash some of those things over the course of this conversation and inspire a few more people to get into the industry thank you so much for that Zainab great to get a bit of insight into you Um, but I'd love to dig into life before VC so I think your, your parents were entrepreneurs if not mistaken so could you tell us a bit about your upbringing and how that entrepreneurial early life experience uh, shaped you in your career? As you said, my parents were engineers. They started their own company when I was a kid. Actually, I think it was founded the day I was born. 
I was born and raised in Turkey and they bootstrapped it. I mean, they had bank loans and, you know, that was the way to build companies at the time. Venture didn't exist. I think venture barely existed around the world and it definitely didn't exist in Turkey at the time. I did my undergraduate degree in in the US and there I kind of saw venture ecosystem. It immediately made me think, you know, if my parents had this capital, not just financial capital, but also, you know, the know-how that would allow them to take ambitious risks, uh, which is, I think, quite different than the kind of risk they were taking because they were focused on growing, but growing cautiously because it's a bootstrap business, you have bank loans. Venture allows you to think very differently about taking risks. That's, you know, what I wanted to do after school, effectively. I wanted to learn about investing, learn about, you know, businesses and financial models in the US and then go back into Turkey and create this ecosystem. Love that. In order to get to that VC role, you spent time in investment banking, in private equity, and and then also uh, tech unicorn world remit. Do you mind for anyone that doesn't know your backstory, just sharing a bit about sort of how your career evolved prior to joining General Catalyst and, and why you made the different moves that you did? Was it deliberate? Some were deliberate and some things just happened. I moved to London from the US to join TA Associates, which is a legendary investment firm. It's been around for you know, more than 50 years. They invested in profitable growth companies. So it was slightly different than private equity. It was growth equity. At TA, they invested in founder-owned businesses that were profitable. So it was very much like my parents' business. So when I kind of met them while I was in banking, I thought like, this is the perfect opportunity and I'm moving to Europe and I'll get to invest in Turkey. Just before I joined, actually, it was a military coup in Turkey. Even though my mandate was to invest in Turkey, suddenly that wasn't looking that attractive. The silver lining is that my world actually got much bigger. I think in Europe, if you're an investor, you have a bit of a geo trap because coverage is quite fragmented. The companies, the founders, and you end up specializing in certain regions, which couldn't be the case for me. So I really focused on certain sectors and I really built my intellect in those sectors, which I believe is super important, especially when you're doing early stage investing to have a product mindset. So that's what I did. TA, I focused on investing in financial technology companies across Europe. I worked with fast growing profitable businesses, but I really wanted was to get more exposure to these companies that were kind of changing the world is how I would define them. And World Remit was one of them. We had the the huge honor of having the the late great co-founder of World Remit, Catherine Wines, on the podcast a few years back. And she actually became a bit of a a mentor to me before she sadly passed. So we know a a little bit about the kind of what a great business it is and and what an impact it's had uh, in the world. I know you specifically joined because you really wanted to get that operator experience under your belt to help you better support entrepreneurs. So do you mind sharing a bit more about your time at World Remit and how it's changed how you work with founders now as an investor? Taking a product from zero to one is actually something quite tactical. And I think scaling operations of a business that's doing hundreds of millions of revenues and still growing organically really fast, that's also quite tactical. Meaning you need to have certain skills to take a product from zero to one and to scale a business that's growing really fast organically at scale. So at World Remit, I had the opportunity to do that. And because I was at a growth business, I got to learn from you know, amazing operators. I worked really closely with Arno Lozo and Br- Brian Corcoran. They were the CEOs of the company. They taught me how to scale from an organization perspective, the org design and people, scaling product teams, scaling technology, scaling marketing. But also my other responsibility was to launch new consumer products in Africa. During that period that I was living in South Africa for, for part of it, I built products from zero to one. And I think those are both important in both identifying what kind of companies to invest in, being able to read founders, but also being able to support founders throughout that whole journey from, as I said, seed to IPO. Love that. Well, we've seen um, more and more operators making that move into VC, which I guess historically, you know, you've seen a lot more people that have come from finance and just sort of career long investors. But it's great to see that trend sort of taking shape. So so how do you think that shift from more operators getting involved is really benefiting founders, but also VC firms? It's great because it's bringing diversity of thought to the venture ecosystem. So most venture partners in Europe historically come from banking, consulting, or their lifelong investing backgrounds. And this is not really surprising because if you look at the European venture ecosystem, there weren't that many scale-ups in Europe you know, 10 years ago. Only now we are seeing experienced operators who learned in these startups and at scale-ups now leaving to join venture firms 
to share their experience. So I don't think either one is better, but what matters is the diversity of thought. So that's why I love, you know, having more operators joining the VC side. That's great to hear. Yeah, the combination is definitely very powerful. Well, you're now a general catalyst. So you, you joined after your time at, at World Remit. So your focus is fintech and crypto. So tell us a bit about why it was that GC stood out to you and, and why the focus on fintech and crypto? At GC, we are super thematic in the way we invest. So I am part of, you know, the fintech and crypto team. We make our investment decisions within our fintech and crypto team. That was one of the main reasons that I decided to join General Catalyst, because I think in Europe, that's a very rare approach. I also love the fact that we operate as one global team. So when we operate as a one global fintech and crypto team, we are constantly learning from each other about different trends. Like one example in fintech would be open banking payments, which we have had since 2019. I've also invested in a company called TrueLayer. So I've seen the journey of what happened with open banking from a regulation perspective, as well as consumer adoption, the business adoption. And now in the US, there's a new law coming in called FedNow, which is effectively the account-to-account -account payments version in the US. So that information exchange that we can have with the US and Europe as well as Africa um, is, I think, super valuable to doing the right investments as well as to supporting our founders when they think about expanding internationally. That's awesome. Well, it's a very popular space. We, we have a lot of people listening to this podcast that work in fintech and crypto, but those are areas and industries that have been hit by the, the economic downturn. I'd love to get your thoughts, particularly for anyone that's maybe questioning being in the industry. Why are you still bullish about investing in that space? And, and what other areas are you really excited about? There has definitely been a correction in, in valuations. The thing I know kind of having done investing is venture as an asset class, it should be recession proof because we're investing behind certain trends like e-commerce or cloud or now AI. And these trends are so big that they will move mountains. And if the mar there's a market downturn, it's not really going to matter at the early stages of investing and company building. So from that perspective, I really focus on a few trends in fintech that excite me. And I think the market timing matters for that. Like, for example, when the interest rates are rising, cash is more valuable. So what are some software tools that are in the market to help businesses, both SMEs and enterprises, manage cash? That's one way of thinking about it. The other way of thinking about it is if you look at the success stories that we've had in Europe within fintech, a lot of them have been in consumer. You know, we have Monzo, Revolut, Transwise, uh, World Remit. These companies had to build their financial infrastructures in-house. A lot of their payments operating systems, fraud compliance, because they didn't really have third party tools that they could purchase. So now we're seeing a number of operators who built these, you know, internally at, let's say, Revolut or Rolldream and now leaving and productizing it. And because of that, there's going to be a new generation of fintech companies emerging in Europe that will actually be enterprise software, not consumer facing. No, we've definitely seen that, I guess, in terms of the sorts of searches that we've worked on, you know, some of the most exciting ones and the most exciting companies are in that B2B SaaS enterprise space. Very exciting times ahead. And it's great to hear how positive you are on the opportunities for anyone that is in that space at the moment. We're also going to have a lot of people listening that may be operators in fintech or tech in general that are looking to make the same move as you into the VC space, which historically has been a difficult path for many to get into. So what advice do you have for anyone that's in this space at the moment looking to become a VC from an operator background? I'd say get involved. That's what I did. As an operator, you have so much value that you can actually give to these founders. Because I would say some of the founders, especially at the ideating stage, they can find speaking to investors threatening. They are looking for people with certain specific industry expertise which the operators have, and especially operators that are more operating at the mid-levels of the company, have more of that particular expertise. So there are different ways to get involved. I got involved by doing angel investing, and I only angel invested in things that were really, I'd say, lightning moments for me. So they would solve an immediate problem that I was facing at that time at Waldermitt. Let's say I was building something in crypto, and that's how I invested in Ramp, because they were solving a problem for me. And the same thing with my investment in Sequoia, which was a KYB compliance company. So I've seen the challenges in that, and I invested in the company. So I think you're in a specific 
place as an operator to use your intellect to both be helpful to these companies, but also make great investments because you're in it. So you know what works and what doesn't work. That's such great advice. We've seen the kind of emergence of a number of angel syndicates involving operators in, in scale-ups as a way to sort of start dipping your toe into the investing landscape. So we've seen that trend recently. It's such good advice for anyone listening, looking to make that move to into VC to maybe start by yeah sharing your value and, and getting involved with some angel investing. How did you get up to speed with the industry? You know, obviously, clearly you have a financial background, but when you first started, what helped you get up the learning curve quicker? Being, you know, operating in payments, which is a very broad area, helped me. Because if you think about payments, it's a very big part of the financial sector. So it's not just processing of payments, but it's also compliance. It's also financial operations, so FinOps. And also I had a lot of exposure to crypto, having worked in cross-border payments. Really picking a few points that you're passionate about and picking wider ones rather than focusing on a single sub-theme is helpful to get up to speed with, you know, any sector that you want to focus on. It's really, really great advice. Thank you, Zena. There are going to be people that are using your mentorship to good effect to start interviewing with VCs. And obviously, GC is a, you know, hugely respected fund. So for anyone that might be thinking about applying to join the business, how would you describe the culture? Have you got any advice for, for someone that's been through that inter- interview process? process relatively recently. Any tips or pointers for anyone that might be looking to get involved? So GC as a firm is an incredibly collaborative firm. Um, That's why we also pride ourselves in specializing in certain topics because we constantly collaborate with my other partners in both making investment decisions, but also supporting our company. I think curiosity is probably, in my point of view, the most important value that we have at GC because it's effectively our curiosity that makes us become experts on certain topics and also identify new topics. Like, for example, merging of fintech and crypto strategy was a key decision for us that we did in at the end of last year. Our point of view on crypto is still incredibly bullish, especially from a financial infrastructure perspective. So I'd say be curious, be bold, be collaborative. Love that advice. Great traits. And uh, yeah, hopefully that helps anyone that's uh, looking to apply. I know you're based in London, but focus on investments across Europe, but also with early stage companies in emerging markets. So how do you find navigating this broad, multiple different markets? And why would you say it's a great time for fellow investors to be sort of focusing their attention on uh, emerging markets specifically? As I had mentioned, in Europe, you will have a lot of people or a lot of funds doing more geo coverage rather than sector coverage, which actually makes sense when you put it into practice because, you know, I have, I think, been in a different country almost every week since the start of the year. So there is the structural issue of having global coverage. You need to kind of put yourself out there. You need to travel to meet founders. But also after COVID, you know, since we've moved to Zoom, that's made things very, you know, easy in terms of working with founders and meeting founders. From my perspective, rather be thematic and not be, you know, stuck in one geography. Because if I see a trend that's emerging in Europe, it's very likely that something similar is happening in Africa. Let's say what happened with POSs in in Europe is now starting to happen in Africa, which has a completely different fintech infrastructure that is mobile money. So you need to know the particularities of each region and you need to make the time and effort to go visit, build a network there. I still prefer to invest the way that we invest because I feel that we are a lot more helpful to our founders in defining their company strategy. Really interesting. Thank you, Zenit. I know it's a bit like picking your favorite child. Are there any particular emerging market startups that you're really excited about at the moment? You know, if so, why? So I can't call out one startup, but I'll I'll say one theme, which is crypto cross-border payments. I've seen this in Nigeria, which is now, you know, there's a big adoption of crypto not for consumer payments, but particularly for business payments. And um, the other, from a consumer perspective, what's interesting for me is effectively democratizing US dollars, so giving access to USDC. A lot of emerging markets have capital controls, which make it difficult for both people, but more so the businesses, to have access to foreign currency and to pay for their suppliers, typically that are international, because these are emerging markets, so they're heavily import dependent. So that's a core topic for me because I think that the truly believe that crypto will change payments and financial infrastructure. And I think that's going to be starting the emerging markets because there it's a hair of fire problem. I'm constantly meeting companies in Nigeria or some in Latin America that are solving for this. 
Amazing. Sounds like a, an area to really watch, an amazing opportunity for some of those emerging market founders and startups out there. So looking forward to seeing how that trend develops. You've clearly worked with some absolutely incredible and really stellar founders, the likes of Truelair and Taxstone, and you mentioned Ramp and various others over the years. There are going to be founders that are aspiring to build businesses so scale that are listening to this. So when it comes to assessing founders and their business models, when people pitch to you, what is it you're particularly looking for? And, and yeah, have you got any advice for anyone that might be in that phase at the moment? It's really all about the founder. If you're at the phase of building a company and you're just starting, I think it's important to answer the question, why? Like, why are you starting this business? I think that is just so much more important than the product, the market, the business model. None of that matters. I think that why your motivation, your passion is pretty much everything. Because once you start building something, it's quite likely that you're going to have a number of pivots. But if you have the passion to solve a problem, you'll find a way to solve it, no matter what comes in your way. So when I meet founders, when I meet companies, there are different approaches I have to invest in. It can be the lightning moment, which means that it's solving an immediate product problem I have. It could be more thematic, as I mentioned with the interest rates. What matters the most and the question I ask is, why are you building this? What is your personal story behind your decision to build this business? And I guess that's where storytelling comes in and is so important to be able to sell that big vision. That's really interesting. And for anyone that it kind of getting involved or pitching to GC, what does the actual investment process look like for any founders that end up partnering with you? Because of our thematic focus, we make our investment decisions within Intake and Crypto Groups. I think that's, I mean, the founders love that because... A lot of us major in fintech and crypto. So typically you kind of don't have to do half of the explaining that you might otherwise need to do. So the investment decisions are made within our fintech and crypto groups. But for uh, growth stage investments, we have a more firm wide decision making policy because at that stage, it's gone beyond product and it's more about the business. And as you said, the business model, the traction and revenue metrics. I believe that when you are doing growth investing, that knowledge is actually quite transferable. You know, evaluating a consumer business versus a fintech business versus an enterprise business. The knowledge and the, and the metrics are quite transferable, which is not the case in early stage. So that's how we do our uh, investing. That's super interesting. And I guess that we talked briefly about the shift in the market or the market correction, as you, you described it, which is clear for everyone to see. But I guess... For you personally, how have what you looked for in founders and businesses changed over the last 12 months with that correction? Have things dramatically changed or, or not really for you? It's changed, I think. And it's normal that it's changed because cash today is more valuable than it was before. And that's a financial phenomenon because interest rates are higher. So the question of, you know, runway becomes more important. So how much runway you have with this, with the funding you currently have or with the funding you're planning to raise? I think a lot of us are asking the question, and I think it's good that we're asking it, and I think it's good that the founders are asking it. You know, is this financing going to be enough for you to get to the next funding round? What level of traction you're going to be able to achieve at this funding round? I think that determines also the funding size. I think founders or investors didn't think about it so much because there was a lot of liquidity and, you know, the focus was more on raising a lot and growing a lot. But now the fundamentals matter more. That's one change in the industry that I'm seeing. And I think it's a healthy one. Definitely. Um, and I guess you've seen it from the beginning of your life and upbringing, how your parents bootstrapped the business and you've seen the hyper growth uh, scale up wild. And now you've seen this market correction where we're seeing more sustainable businesses and hopefully more profitable ones. Given that there are now fewer unicorns and, and there is that sort of new sh sharpened focus, how are you advising your current portfolio on navigating that, this new climate? Is there anything we've not covered yet that you just think is just really important for any founders to hear from messages you're passing on? I mean, time is uh, really of essence here in the sense that how quickly you take action to make changes in the way you think about growth and your business model. Because the thing in, especially for growth stage companies, you can't really make adjustments to your budget. You kind of need to re redo everything from scratch. You, and that's always my recommendation. Like, don't adjust the current budget. Just zero budgeting. Like, just do it from scratch. You're making a pretty fundamental change. And when you that make that change, actually putting it into practice takes time. Because there is, you know, you work with a lot of people. There's a culture in the firm. You might need to be, you know, changing the org design. And these don't happen, you know, in one day. It usually takes minimum six six months. 
for a proper transition. I think the founders that acted very swiftly last year in May are the ones now that are a bit more comfortable. And I guess for other founders that are currently fundraising at the moment, are there are there any particular questions you feel that they should be asking VCs when they're going through that process, maybe that, that might be different to before? And on the flip side of that, are there any common mistakes you're seeing founders make at the moment that are, are putting you off investing? I think one mistake the founders made was the preference for you know capital with no strings attached. And I think the founders now see that and the market just sees that there is value in having a partner that is there for you facing all certain times. And I'm already seeing that change. My advice would be more particularly decide what kind of a partner you're looking for. So are you looking for someone who's going to take you on product from zero to one? If you design partners or you want to, you know, you already have product market fit and you want to get your first customers, you want to set pricing, you want to set your sales team, or you are you know, already a big company and you're thinking about how do I scale this without breaking things inside. There are different funds have different specialty in each sector, uh, in each segment of this. But also the partner within that fund that you partner with is also important because it is a partnership for life, pretty much. It, it's a long time that you end up partnering together, especially in our case. Having that personal fit is important. Having someone who has experience, ideally on all segments, so both from like going from zero to one, but also scaling at scale is important. And that makes sure that partner has time on his hands so, or her hands because they were very active investing. So they probably have a pretty big portfolio that they're working with now. So I think that's also quite important. Really good advice. And I guess for, for people that have successfully pressed you with their questions in their business model and you've invested in, are, are there any particular founders that you'd call out that have really nailed it when it comes to how they've pitched the business or just how they conduct themselves throughout the funding process that would be a kind of shining light to other founders out there that are going through it? It's showing that passion for why, like answering that question, why really well or why you're starting this business. So if I look at the companies I've invested in, I think that that's always what I really focus on. What was the personal experience that made you start this company? And what are some personal experiences you've had combined with your passion for this solving this problem is going to help you persevere through, you know, all the issues that you're going to be facing as you build your business. Great advice. And we know there's always lots of, uh, it's a roller coaster, which we talk about all the time on this podcast. It's certainly not going to be all one-way traffic. So yeah, being ready for that, I think, yeah, it's really good advice. Final question before we get to our wrap-ups, Zainab. Um, what is the best way for founders listening to this to get in touch with you and to make that first kind of good impression? You know, I'm on LinkedIn. You can reach me via email. I have a medium post. Then also I have a fintech news essay called The Finstack. So even, you can even come to the office. It's in London. So we are approachable. You know, we love meeting founders, what we really care about is they are passionate about solving a problem and they have an answer to the question why. Love that. Thank you so much, Zena. It's been a real pleasure chatting to you. Uh, we've got our final three wrap-up questions. Uh, already, we've got tons of great mentorship in there for our listeners. So I know it's going to be a very popular episode. In one sentence, what do you think the future holds for General Catalyst? I think in the future, General Catalyst is not going to be called a venture capital firm. It's so much bigger than that. We are in the business of value creation. And I think that can mean many things. It's not just venture investing. It's also, you know, supporting growth companies. It's also creating companies. And we recently launched another strategy called the customer value strategy. I believe that's the future of General Catalyst. Feels like we've got a spoiler there. Really exciting times ahead. And what is the best piece of advice that you've ever been given that you can pass on to, to any founders or operators that are, are listening? It's the best time to build a company. You know, the founders that are in the market today, they're operating in an incredible talent market, particularly in Europe. It's also a time when they're building, they're going to have to focus on fundamentals. They're going to be more efficient with their cash. And I think they're going to be grateful for that, that they haven't spent so much to get to product market fit or initial signs of distribution success. And I advise them to partner with, you know, long-term patient capital who are focused on building these enduring companies. Love it. Thank you very much. And have you got a lot of people excited and uh, nodding along there, I'm sure. So now is the time to get stuck in. And finally, this podcast is called 40 Minute Mentor. So I have to ask if you could be mentored by anyone, dead or alive, who would it be and why? It would be Indra Nuye, who was the former CEO of, who is the former CEO of Pepsi uh, and chairman. Highly recommend reading her book called My Life in Full. I participated in one of her lectures at my, during my MBA at Harvard and she is 
she's just an inspirational woman and had commitment to diversity of workforce and also healthy products at Pepsi, which was definitely at the time not a trend. And he really talks about also the values of family in her life and how she couldn't have, have done it without you know her values and family. So yeah, she's an incredible woman. Thank you so much, Zena. Been a real privilege to chat to you. Thank you so much for coming on the 40 Minute Mentor and sharing your career story and amazing advice with our listeners. Wishing you all the very best for the year ahead and thank you again for coming on. Thank you. I really hope you enjoyed this episode with Zainab and if you're a founder that it's been useful ahead of your next fundraise. As always we've left links in the show notes so if you want to connect with Zainab or find out more about GC then please check it out. And if you're enjoying this series so far, then please make sure you spread the word by sharing your favorite piece of mentorship or episode on LinkedIn, tagging JBM or myself, James Mitra. I look forward to seeing your posts. Thanks again for all your support. And I hope to see you next week for more VC Mentorship.